Okay, we will begin. Um, we are recording this webinar and it will be available on careersinenergy.ca next week. Um, I'd like to start uh, in the spirit of reconciliation by honoring our ancestors and acknowledging the Treaty 7 territory. We acknowledge the Treaty 7 nations, the Siksika First Nation, the Pecani First Nation, the Kana First Nation, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, and the Tsutsina First Nation. We acknowledge the ancestral territory of the Siksikate Satapi, the Blackfoot Confederacy, and the home of Métis Region Number 3. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, the Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land and who honour and celebrate this territory. Uh, the project that we're talking about today was funded in, by the province of Alberta, working in partnership with the Government of Canada to provide employment support programs and services. Opinions shared in this webinar are petrol amis and do not necessarily reflect those of the government. I should say they're also eco candidates, I suppose. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to put your comments into the chat or ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Um, I think that's still an option. I don't see it on mine anymore, but uh, if you have any technical difficulties, just find a way to flag us so that we, uh, we can slow down and address those. So to start with, I am Brianne. I am the program manager for the Petroleum Labour Market Information Division of Energy Safety Canada. And Energy Safety Canada has a mandate to collaborate with industry, government, educators, and training agencies to support and advance the development of a sustainable, skilled, and productive workforce. Uh, we specialize in oil and gas labour market data and insights as well as resources for workforce and career planning. And I'm here today with Jenny Peters. Uh, Jenny is an economist with a PhD in economics from Texas A&M University. Uh, she is a senior research manager at Eco Canada and is responsible for the management, execution and delivery of environmental labor market information and national occupation standards projects. Uh, she works with an army of professionals comprised of staff, consultants, strategic advisors, and subject matter experts. Uh, before joining Eco Canada, Jenny applied her knowledge and skills in a wide range of roles and in industries. She worked as a lecturer for 14 years and taught a wide range of economics courses and supervised student research projects. Um, more recently, she also managed labor market research initiatives. Um, including economic modeling and reporting at Petrol MI. So we are quite familiar with one another. Uh, today we're talking about uh, the report that Petrol MI released uh, in September. And the report pulls together uh, secondary research and findings from interviews with seven energy services companies and three industry associations and highlights the chain of activities involved in closure, as well as the key well servicing and environmental occupations involved and the competencies required, including the top in demand roles. So with that, let's get into it. So the federal and provincial governments uh, have created new financial initiatives and policy measures to create jobs and work in the oil and gas industry and to improve the environment. Measures such as the COVID-19 Economic Response Plan, the Alberta Site Rehabilitation Program, the SRP as we will call it, and the Provincial Liability Management Framework are attended, intended to address a significant inventory of inactive wells. So a little bit about the SRP is that it aims to get specialized oil and gas labor force workers back to work. Uh, it aims to accelerate site abandonment and reclamation efforts and complete a high volume of environmentally significant work. Uh, the program provides grants during several designated funding periods, starting with period one, which opened on May 1st, 2020. And the grants cover varying percentages of the total program costs, depending on the specific criteria for each period. The SRP is currently expected to end in March 2022, and all work for the grants um, must be completed by December 2022. So what is a well closure anyway? 
Uh, closure is the last critical stage in a life cycle of an oil or gas well. Well closure activities can be broken at, down into several stages. Abandonment includes the um, taking the well out of service and permanently shutting down, plugging, uh, removing the wellhead, and that's when it's considered safe and secure by regulators. Uh, decommissioning is removing as much infrastructure as possible from the site, uh, facilities, surface pipelines, wells, and so on. The only infrastructure that's allowed to remain would be infrastructure that's considered an improvement, and that has to have landowners written permission to remain. Then the site assessment and remediation phases where a site is assessed for any contamination of soil or groundwater. And if any contamination is found, uh, they are removed and, and taken to a disposal facility for treatment. Uh, some can also be treated on site. And then the reclamation phase where the land is returned to its predisturbed state or equivalent through activities like replacing topsoil, landscaping, uh, and through ongoing soil and water sampling. So many stakeholders play an active role in the management of activities related to well closure in Alberta. Alberta Energy administers the SRP and sets the policy for the liability management framework. Uh, the Alberta Energy Regulator ensures safe, efficient, and orderly and environmentally responsible development of Alberta's energy resources uh, through regulation and enforcement. The Orphan Well Association, or OWA, manages the production and closure of oil and gas wells, pipelines, and facilities that no longer have an owner, including remediation and reclamation work, and they receive their funding through the Orphan Fund Levy, which is paid by producers. Uh, oil and gas producers are responsible for closure activities on their own well sites and they pay into the orphan fund levy. Under the new liability management framework, active site operators will have mandatory five-year rolling spending targets for site reclamation work. Uh, the service companies are contracted by producers or the OWA to actually complete the abandonment, decommissioning, remediation and reclamation work. Um, and then Indigenous communities and First Nations and Métis settlements can nominate on reserved or on settlement sites for closure and Indigenous businesses are actively encouraged and supported to play a role in closure work. And finally, landowners can also nominate sites for closure activities on their properties. Uh, there are many different opportunities for employment in the abandonment, decommissioning, remediation, and reclamation of a well site. A recent report by the Petroleum Services Association of Canada found that between 35 to 50 services employing 41 to 57 workers are needed in the closure of a single well. Typical services include trucking, site inspection, wireline operations, downhole tools, service rigs, bulldozing, and excavating, among many others. Here are the top in-demand occupations for well closure activities in Alberta. I encourage you to visit our website and take a look at the report. Uh, you'll be able to see each of these occupations along with their descriptions, education, and skills required. As well, you can click on each occupation and you'll be linked to either the Careers in Energy website or Eco Canada's website for more details. I'll now pass it over to Jenny to discuss the environmental occupation forecast and opportunities that are available there. Thanks Brianne. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Let's see. All right. All right, I'm hoping everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation. Excellent. So uh, today I wanna to talk a little bit about um, a labor demand outlook that we've done for Alberta for the period of time 2020 to 2030. Uh, so we're calling this from recession to recovery, Alberta's environmental workforce needs to 2030. So, 
before I get into the actual report and the information that we're going to be providing, I do want to talk a little bit about Eagle Canada. You may not be familiar with us as an organization. Uh, we've been around since about 1992, and we are the steward for the environmental workforce across Canada. That's doesn't matter what industry workers are in, doesn't matter what types of occupations those workers are in, if they contribute to environmental protection, natural resource management or sustainability, we count them as environmental workers. And so we provide supports for those workers through a variety of programs, training programs, networking programs, certification programs, university accreditation programs, and of course the research that we're gonna be talking about here today. Before I talk a little bit about the numbers that, uh, that we found, uh, I want to, do, to address the definition of an environmental workforce. Um, it's actually a, a little tricky to define who is and who isn't an environmental worker. There are a lot of different opportunities or options for, for definitions. The approach that we've taken at EcoCanada is to break it down into two classification streams. One is a group of individuals who we call core environmental workers. Those are individuals who are uh, required to have environmental specific competencies, skills, training, or knowledge in order to be able to do their job. It doesn't matter what industry they're in. They could be in mining, forestry, oil and gas, uh, public administration, education. If their job requires them to have specific environmental competencies, they would be counted as environmental core environmental workers. The other stream we consider are individuals who work for environmental goods and services organizations. So these are organizations that are pro providing environmental services or producing environmental goods. Uh, again, for the environmental protection, natural resource management and sustainability. In this stream, we consider any occupation that's related to the environmental activity to, to count as part of the EGS workforce. And that could be individuals including presidents of companies, administrative assistants, custodial workers, uh, accountants. Uh, these are individuals who don't necessarily need to have environmental skills or competencies, but their work is integral to the operation of the environmental goods and services organization. Taking these two classification streams together, we combine them to, to create our definition of an environmental worker. So for Alberta, we uh, uh, estimate that Alberta has the fourth largest environmental workforce across Canada, uh, which is consistent with uh, the population of Alberta being roughly the fourth largest population provincially as well. We estimate there are about 96,100 environmental workers or were environmental workers in 2020 in Alberta. We also think that that's about 4.4% of the total workforce across Canada or across Alberta. So we foresee that the, the uh, proportion of the total workforce that is environmental in Alberta is actually about the second highest across Canada uh, for, the, for the provincial regions, short only uh, a little bit behind British Columbia in this case. When we take a look at the hiring that we expect to go uh, on over the next 10 years, we estimate that there will be about 57,800 net environmental job openings to 2030. Uh, and again, that includes core environmental workers, uh, which make up about 23,200 or 40% or of that environmental hiring total, uh, and the EGS workers as well. We identified that some of the hiring, uh, about 28,100 jobs, is going to come from growth in the environmental sector, so environmental expansion demand. And then the remainder, 29,600, is going to come from workers leaving the sector and needing to be replaced. That's what we call replacement demand. So the sum of the expansion demand, the growth in the sector, and the replacement demand is what we refer to as the net hiring requirements. 
the total growth of the environmental sector or the uh, environmental workforce is expected to be about 29% of 2020's values. So that's growing slightly faster than the Alberta economy as a whole, which is anticipated to grow about 25% over that same period of time. The primary occupations that are involved in environmental work are in the natural and applied sciences and related occupations discipline or job family. That includes engineers, scientists, meteorologists, uh, mechanical technicians, and, and uh, uh, information technologies, information systems analysts, and, and data analysts. The, the second largest job family is management occupations. About 17% uh, of the total environmental occupations across Canada are considered are considered to be management occupations uh, across Alberta are considered to be uh, management occupations. But you'll see from this chart here that there are actually a large number of uh, individuals in a wide variety of different types of job families or occupations, from occupations in manufacturing and utilities, that includes water and wastewater treatment operators, trades, transport and equipment operators, includes truck drivers, heavy equipment operators, carpenters, electricians, and so forth. Occupations in art, culture, recreation, and sport, we even see a small number of environmental workers in that job family as well, primarily in the custodial uh, conservation and conservatory type of occupations. If we take a look at the top occupations across Alberta, we see that if we look at the, the definition based on the Envi environmental employment share, the, the proportion of the uh, total workforce that would be considered environmental, we see that meteorologists and climatologists are at the top of the list and where we estimate about 64% of meteorologists and climatologists in Alberta are considered to be environmental workers followed by lumber graders and other wood, pro wood processing inspectors and graders and water and wastewater treatment operators. However, if we take a look at the total number of environmental workers, we see that the top of the list is filled by civil engineers, with about 4,300 civil engineers considered to be environmental workers across Alberta. That's followed by petroleum engineers and inspectors and in, in public and environmental health and occupational health and safety. Similar to the top occupations by environmental employment levels, hiring is also expected to be highest for civil engineers. We're expected to see about 3,700 civil engineers uh, hired over the next 10 years, then followed by inspectors in public and environmental health and occupational health and safety. If we take a look at the breakdown of the environmental workforce by industry, we see a couple of interesting uh, findings. First, the vast majority of, uh, or the, the highest uh, employment of environmental workers in industry form is in professional scientific and technical services with about 25,500 environmental workers in that industry in Alberta. Similarly, professional scientific and technical services are up at the top of the list for the environmental employment share as well. So that we estimate the proportion of uh, environmental workers in that industry is about 14.6%. One uh, industry that pops up on the top five list that's uh, perhaps surprising to, to some individuals is the mining, quarrying and oil and gas extraction sector which falls in the top three for environmental employment levels and the top four for the environmental employment share. From the perspective of somebody familiar with the environmental sector, this is not surprising, however, because we do know that there is a strong emphasis on sustainability, on energy efficiency, on renewable energy development, and uh, on uh, the, the 
environmental protection and, and wetlands and wildlife protection within the oil and gas industry in Alberta. I dug a little deeper into some of the information we had about the types of occupations that are heavily employed as environmental workers in various industries. And I found that there's a lot of difference across industry sectors. For example, if we take a look at those professional scientific and technical services, we have a lot of individuals who would be considered office workers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, database analysts, information systems analysts, and so forth. When we take a look at the construction industry, we see a very different group of individuals at the top of the list for environmental employment, heavy duty equipment mechanics, construction managers, contractors and supervisors for oil and gas drilling and services, and so forth. Similarly, we've got a different crew of workers in the environmental sphere in the mining and quarrying and oil and gas extraction sector, where we've got oil and gas well drillers, petroleum engineers, uh, chemical engineers, and geological engineers. So what this shows me is that there is a wide variety of opportunities for individuals who are interested in working in the environmental sphere or contributing to environmental protection resource management or sustainability. And it's not necessary to work for an environmental goods and services company directly. To wrap up, I thought I'd take a, a deeper dive into some of the numbers related to the uh, well servicing occupations that uh, Brianne was talking about earlier uh, in the administrative and support waste management and remediation services industry. That would be the industry that would include the site assessment and remediation activities that the uh, previous presentation was describing. If we take a look at the employment of some of these well servicing occupations, we see that we expect to have a growth or an increase in the number of contractors and supervisors for oil and gas drilling and services, about 17% increase. Oil and gas well drillers, servicers, testers, and related workers, about 23% increase. And oil and gas drilling, servicing, and related laborers, about a 29% increase. These numbers are based on a forecast which does not take into account um, the development of new special projects or special programs for well closures. And so we would consider these to be uh, definitely um, baseline estimates for, for what we would expect to see going forward. And thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thank you, Ginny. Um, I will open it up now for any questions that people may have. Um, you can type it into the Q&A or add your uh, comment to the chat and we will be happy to address any of your, your questions. I do also have... Um, There's no questions coming in so far. You guys are a very quiet bunch. Uh, if there aren't any questions, I will uh, do our final poll, just asking if uh, you found this webinar valuable. If you do have questions, um, please do feel free to reach out to myself or to Jenny, um, as we're happy to address them uh, off the webinar, if, if that is helpful. And the report that we mentioned is available on careersinenergy.ca. And Jenny, when will your forecast be released? Uh, we're hoping the end of December. Okay, so you can watch for more details on that uh, later this year.
I'm not seeing any questions or comments in the chat. So we will uh, end it early here. Thanks so much for attending. And uh, as I mentioned, this will be available uh, on careersandenergy.ca next week. Um, so you can feel free to pass it on to anybody that might find the content valuable, or if you signed on a little bit later, you can uh, watch the beginning part if, if you're so inclined. And thanks and have a great Friday, everyone. Thank you.